Okay, we've got to change the schedule, everybody. The, we're going to do the uh, McCarthyism talk, which is scheduled for uh, this afternoon. I'm going to give that now. And the Our Constitution talk will be given at 1.40. So once again, uh, welcome Mr. Jim Drummond. You're really going to get a dose today of me. You get the first four talks from me, but then the good news is you won't hear from me again until Wednesday. Please. <clears throat> the talk you're going to hear now is the... Uh, <clears throat> I'm the only person that gives this talk. But it's one that I think is so important that I've asked to add this to the schedule here at the Indiana camp. And it deals with a United States Senator named Joseph Raymond McCarthy. People say to me, why do you want to talk about a man who died 32 years ago? How important can that be? I want to talk about him for three reasons. First of all, in justice to his memory. For there is no politician in American history who's been lied about more than Joe McCarthy. And so in honor of his memory to try and straighten out those lies, I'd like to talk about him this morning. Secondly, I don't think there's any era in American history about which there is more confusion or misinformation than that period from 1950 to 1954. And I think it's important for us to know an accurate history of that period. That's the second reason why I'm going to talk about Joe McCarthy. The third reason is the problems about which Joe McCarthy was concerned, infiltration of the United States government by communists, by Americans who were working for the Soviet Union, is as serious today, if not more serious, than it was in the 1950s. Hardly a month goes by that Americans are not arrested in this country for spying for the Soviet Union even in 1989. And I think that problem is very serious today, and therefore I think it's important for us to understand just what McCarthyism is all about. And believe me, if there's an issue you can have some fun with in your classes, this is it. And I'm going to mention to you now that there is a 16-page pamphlet called Setting the Record Straight. And it's got almost all the information you would need about the career of Senator McCarthy. What he said, what he did, the communists that he exposed, and so on. And you can get copies of this, and you can write a terrific uh, term paper. In fact, I have prepared an outline of a term paper. So if you want an easy paper to write, you write to me, and I'll send you that outline, and you can whip up a term paper in a real big hurry. I'd like to do something a little bit unusual in talking about this subject, and that is to take on the role of Senator McCarthy myself. And I in other words, I'm going to talk to you in the first person. I'm going to pretend that I am Senator McCarthy. My name is Joseph Raymond McCarthy. I was born on November 14, 1908, in Grand Chute Township, Wisconsin. I left school at the age of 14, and I worked for a few years, and then decided that an education was important. So I went back to school, to high school, at the age of 20, and I completed four years of high school in one year. I then went on to Marquette University in Milwaukee, and I graduated from college and from law school in 1935. I returned to my hometown in Wisconsin, and I began the practice of law. In 1939, I ran for circuit judge, and I was elected the youngest circuit judge in Wisconsin history. And I had a pretty good reputation as a judge. I took over a court where there were more than 250 cases backed up, people waiting to have their problems solved. 
And by working long hours, I kept my court open from 6 o'clock in the morning until past midnight on about a dozen occasions. And by doing that, I cleared up that backlog of cases. And I became well known for my work as a judge. In the summer of 1942, although I was 33 years old, and as a judge, I was exempt from military service, I enlisted in the Marines. I became a captain in the Marine Corps, and I was sent to the South Pacific during World War II. And I was an intelligence officer there. It was my job to tell pilots going on bombing missions what to expect, and then to debrief them when they came back from those missions to find out whether they had hit their targets or not. It got a little bit boring doing that, so I asked if I could fly along with them. And I was put in the tail gunner seat at the rear of the plane. And that's where the nickname came from, that I was Tail Gunner Joe. In fact, there was a television movie made about my life in 1977 on the ABC television network, and it was called Tail Gunner Joe. Now, there are some people who have said that I made all of this up that I was never in any dangerous position in World War II, that I never risked my life, that the whole thing was phony. But I want you to know that I did not get the Distinguished Flying Cross, and I did not get the Air Medal, and I did not get a certificate from Admiral Nimitz, the commander of the Pacific Fleet, for my bravery under fire, because I never did anything. So if somebody tells you that Joe McCarthy did not serve his country well in the South Pacific during World War II. They don't know what they're talking about. At the end of the war, I came back to Wisconsin, resumed my job as a circuit judge, and I decided to run for the United States Senate. Nobody gave me a chance. The man who was one of the senators from Wisconsin at that time was Robert La Follette. He had been a senator for about 20 years. And he was so sure that I could not beat him that he never campaigned. He stayed in Washington while I was traveling all over the state of Wisconsin campaigning for that job. And when the Republican primary was held in September of 1946, I ran against Robert La Follette. And when the votes were counted, I had beaten him by 5,000 votes. In Wisconsin at that time, if you were the Republican candidate, you were assured of winning election in November against the Democrat. And that happened in 1946. I beat my Democratic opponent by 250,000 votes. And in January of 1947, I entered the United States Senate in Washington. Nobody heard much about me for those first few years. Some people say that I really never was concerned about communism until 1950, but that's not true. I had talked about communism in my campaign in 1946. I had spoken out against it in 1947 and again in 1948. But the key incident in my life came in November of 1949. I was sitting in my office one night when three men came to see me. They had been to see three other senators. They had a story about communist infiltration of the United States government, and they wanted somebody to do something about it. And the other three senators thought it was too hot an issue. They did not want to touch it. But these three men gave me a 100-page FBI report. The FBI had made an investigation of communists working in the United States government and they had put out a 100-page report in 1947. And now, two years later, nothing had been done about that. And those communists were still working in the United States government for the Soviet Union. When I read that report, I made a decision that I would do something about it. The first opportunity came on February 9, 1950. I went down to Wheeling, West Virginia, to give a talk to a Republican women's club in that city. 
In my talk, I said that I knew of a number of communists who were in the State Department making foreign policy for the United States. Now, you must understand that certain countries had gone communist. You know, we had won World War II, and then immediately after World War II, the communists began taking over various countries. And one of the countries they took over was China. And they were helped to take over China by Americans who were working in our government in Washington and in China. And they were telling us that the communists were nice guys, that we didn't have to worry about them taking over that country. Because looking back now, 40 years later, you can understand how wrong that was. But I knew it was wrong that all those people should become slaves of the communists. And I knew it was wrong that Americans who had helped that to happen were still working for our government. And so I wanted to get these people out of the United States government. In 1946, the Secretary of State, the man in charge of the State Department, said that he knew of 205 people in the State Department who either were communists or they were helping the communists. And when I went down to West Virginia in 1950, I said that while I did not have the names of the 205, I did have the names of 57 people that were either communists or they were helping the communists. Now when I made that statement, by the time the news got back to Washington, and I went from West Virginia out to Salt Lake City and then to Reno for another speech and then came back to Washington. And when I got there, my name was all over the headlines. Nobody had ever heard of me before, but now my name was a national headline because I had said that there were at least 57 communists working in the United States government. On February 20th, 1950, I went to the United States Senate and I gave a speech it took me all day to give the speech. It should have only taken about one hour. But it took me all day because people kept interrupting me. Now I'm going to tell you something that you will find hard to believe. But it's the truth. And you can go back and you can read the congressional record, which is the document that tells you everything that goes on in the Congress of the United States on a certain day. You can go back and you can read the congressional record for February 20th, 1950. You can find it in your libraries. It should be in bound volumes in your libraries. And if you want to read that whole debate that went on that day, you can read it. And you're going to find something very interesting. People have accused me of smearing thousands of innocent people by calling them communists. In my speech on February 20th, 1950, I did not mention anybody's name. All I mentioned were case numbers. I said, I have case number one, case number 10, case number 25. These are people, and I told what each of these people had done to help the communists. But I did not mention their name. And the people in the Senate who didn't like me, they said, come on, McCarthy, tell us the names of these people. And I said, no, I'm not going to give you anybody's name, because if I give you a name and that person is innocent, they will be hurt by this. And I don't want to hurt any innocent person. And you can look it up in the congressional record. That's exactly what I said. But you wouldn't know it from reading stories about me. I refuse to give any names. What the Senate decided to do was to form a committee to investigate my charges. You know, was McCarthy telling the truth? Does he really have information about communists in government? And so they formed a committee but this committee didn't like me. And instead of investigating my charges to see if they were true, the committee decided to investigate me and to make me look bad. And so what the committee did, they wouldn't let me bring in people to testify who could tell what, I, what my side of the story was. But they would bring in people who criticized me. But anybody who said McCarthy is right, they wouldn't let him come in and talk to the committee. But if somebody said McCarthy's wrong, they'd let that person come in and testify. So these hearings went on for about three months. And when the hearings were all over, the committee said, McCarthy's a liar. He doesn't know what he's talking about. There are no communists in government. He made this whole thing up. And a lot of people think 
That's the story of Joe McCarthy. He never had any facts to back up what he was saying. Well, the truth is something different from that. I'm not going to give you some names. If you want, there's a lot of names mentioned in here of people that I talked about, but I don't want to confuse you this morning by using a lot of names. I'm going to mention one name to you. And it's interesting because this man died last week at the age of 89. And the obituaries that appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Boston Globe, and I'm sure in major newspapers in your area, they all mentioned the name of Joe McCarthy and they said that I had ruined this man's reputation. The man's name was Owen Lattimore. And in 1950, that's L-A-T-T-I-M-O-R-E. In 1950, I said that Owen Lattimore was one of the top communists in the United States. And everybody said, no, that's not true. There's no way that he's a communist. And the committee that investigated me, they brought Lattimore in before that committee. And Lattimore said, McCarthy doesn't know what he's talking about. I've never had anything to do with communists. The whole thing's a hoax. And that's what the committee concluded. And this is what the obituaries mentioned in the newspapers last week. They mentioned that first committee report on Lattimore. What they did not mention was the second committee report on Lattimore, which was issued in 1952, two years later. That committee, I was not a member of it, but that committee investigated Owen Lattimore. And what did they conclude? They said that from some time in the 1930s, Owen Lattimore had been a conscious, articulate instrument of the Soviet conspiracy. They said that Owen Lattimore had worked with the Soviet conspiracy with the enemies of the United States against the United States. But in not one of those obituaries that appeared in the newspapers last week did anybody mention that committee report. They only mentioned the first committee which had ignored all the facts about Owen Lattimore. So if somebody says to you, Joe McCarthy never exposed a single communist, one name that you can mention is Owen Lattimore. And there is evidence in Congress, there was a series of 20, there's 20 volumes in this series. It's on an organization called the Institute of Pacific Relations. And in that, those hearings that were conducted by a Senate committee, you will find all the evidence about Owen Lattimore. That committee brought in 13 witnesses, 13 of them. And those 13 said that they knew Owen Lattimore to be a communist or to have helped the communists. 13 different people said that Owen Lattimore either was a communist or he probably was a communist. And that's pretty darn good evidence as far as I'm concerned. But none of those obituaries that talked about the death of Owen Lattimore, none of them mentioned that information. Because to do so would have meant that Joe McCarthy was right. And they don't want anybody to know that Joe McCarthy was right. Just as an aside, there was a book written earlier this year called Loyalties. And the author of the book is Carl Bernstein. You've all heard of the Watergate episode in the 1970s. One of the men who helped to expose that situation was Carl Bernstein. He was a reporter for the Washington Post. He wrote a book last year, Bernstein did, about his mother and father. His mother and father were members of the Communist Party back in the 1940s and the 1950s. And Bernstein has just written a book about it. And when he went back to talk to his father about the book, he asked his father, about the Communist Party. And his father said, Carl, I don't want you to mention that in your book. And Carl said, why not? He said, because it will prove that Joe McCarthy was right. Joe McCarthy was saying that there were communists throughout the United States government in the 40s and 50s, and there were. He was right. But don't you mention that in your book. But Bernstein did. He wrote it up in his book. And it's on the bestseller list today. It's called Loyalties and it's about Carl Bernstein. And you have his father, who was a communist, saying that Joe McCarthy was right when he was saying in 1950 that there were communists in the United States government. From 1950 to 1952, I was only one senator, and I couldn't do very much. 
But in the 1952 election, the Republicans gained control of the Senate. In other words, enough Republicans were elected that year so there were more Republicans than Democrats in the Senate. And when that situation occurs, the party that has the most members, they can choose all the chairman of the committees. And so in January of 1953, I became the chairman of a Senate committee, which was a very powerful job. And my committee had the responsibility for investigating communism in the United States government. And so now I had something I had not had before. I had the authority and I had the power to investigate communism in the United States government. And for the next 15 months, for all of 1953, and for the first three months of 1954, I was able to accomplish a great deal. We investigated communists in defense plants. Plants where we were, you know, the Korean War was going on at that time, in the early 1950s. And certain plants in this country were making weapons. They were making things that our soldiers could use in fighting that war. And we found out that in some of these plants, there were communists who were sabotaging, who were trying to undermine some of the equipment that was being made, who were trying to make our defensive uh, weapons, trying to make them not work. Now that's a situation we could not allow to continue. And so we investigated these plants, and we brought people in that worked in these plants, and they told us about communist, communists that they knew who were working in their own particular section of the plant. And we were able to get more than 30 communists out of these defense plants. So if somebody tells you Joe McCarthy never exposed any communists, you tell them about the communists we got out of General Electric defense plants in New York and in Massachusetts in 1953. We also exposed communists in the Army's radar laboratories in New Jersey. This was an unbelievable situation. The communists had gotten the atomic bomb by stealing American secrets. Americans had given the communists, had given the Soviet Union the secrets as to how to make an atom bomb, a nuclear bomb. And now they were able to do that because they had stolen those secrets from the United States. So we were trying to make weapons now that would allow us to defend ourselves against communist missiles and against communist bombs. And the most important plant in the United States where these measures were being studied and where this work was going on was at a radar laboratory plant in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And would you believe we had evidence that there were several dozen communists who were working in these top secret laboratories in New Jersey. And so we called these people in before our committee. You see, that's how a committee works. We look into a situation, we need to get evidence on it. So we send letters out to people and we ask them to come in and testify before us and tell us what the situation is in their particular place. That's how we get the evidence. And they may say there are certain people that, that were communists. Well, we ask those people to come in. We say, look, so-and-so said you're a communist. Is it true? And we give them a chance to defend themselves, to say, no, it's not true. Or maybe I belong to a to the Communist Party a long time ago, but I don't belong anymore. I'm going to give you a number. I don't like to give too many numbers because they get confusing. But let me give you this one, two numbers. In 1953, my committee invited to Washington 673 people. Now, here's how the committee works. We brought people in to talk to us privately, not in the public. Nobody even knew they were there. The first thing any, any person came to Washington, they talked to us privately. And if we asked them, look, did you belong to the Communist Party? Yeah, I did. It was a mistake when I was in college. I never should have done it. I don't belong anymore. We would say to them, okay, fine, thanks. See you later. They go back home again. Nobody ever knows they came to Washington. Nobody ever knows they talked to the McCarthy Committee. The only people that came before us in public, before the television cameras, were those people who would not cooperate in private, who said, I'm not going to tell you whether I ever joined the Communist Party or not. It's none of your business. I'm going to take the Fifth Amendment. You can't force me to tell you that. I'm not going to tell you that. 
this committee should not be in business. It doesn't matter what you want to know. I'm not going to tell you anything. When someone said that to our committee in private, we brought them in public hearings so people could see who they were. Of the 673 people who came before our committee in private in 1953, we made the names public of only 83 people. Okay? 83 out of 673. That's all. So people that say Joe McCarthy smeared thousands of people don't know what they're talking about. I never mentioned thousands of people. In the five years that I talked against communism, I only mentioned the names of 160 people. So if somebody says to you, Joe McCarthy smeared thousands of people, you say, no, he couldn't have. He only mentioned the names of 160. How could he smear thousands? when he never mentioned more than 160. And you can look up those facts. That's how many people I mentioned. I tried to keep innocent people from being criticized, so we talked to them privately first, and if they had done nothing wrong, or they were sorry for what they had done, we let them go. And it's only those people that were still involved with the communists who refused to cooperate, those are the people we brought before our committee in public, so the news media could see who they were, and they were before the television cameras. So you need to understand that. This is what the situation was like in the early 1950s. So those are a couple of the things that we were able to accomplish, getting communists out of defense plants, getting them out of ra secret radar laboratories in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. One interesting thing that happened while I was a senator, people would call me up, people that worked for the State Department, that worked in the government printing office, the government printing office in Washington prints every document that the federal government puts out, including top secret documents. Now, wouldn't you think it might be important not to have communists working in the government printing office? But we found out that they were working there. Now, some of these top secret documents, they would print one part of the document in room A, and one part of the document in room B, and one part in room C, and one part in room D so that nobody would see the entire document. But there was one place where they assembled the entire document, the assembly room. And guess what? That's where the communists were working, in the one room where you could see the whole document. And you could see this top secret information that if the communists got their hands on it, they could use it to hurt the United States. And we found out there were a group of communists working in that particular assembly room. And the man in charge of it was a man named William Remington. So if somebody says to you, Joe McCarthy never exposed a single communist, you tell them about William Remington. Now what's interesting about William Remington is the FBI told the government four or five years before I came along that Remington was a communist. And they sent report after report after report to the government printing office. They said, look, this guy's a communist, get him out of there. But they didn't. And it wasn't until my committee exposed him that we were able to get him out of the government. And you see, that's what committees can do. You can send all the warnings you want to the head of these departments, but if they don't do anything, then the communists stay in there. So what a committee can do, they can come along and they can expose that situation. They can call public attention to it. And then the people will demand that those people be taken out of the government if they're more loyal to the Soviet Union than they are to the United States. Okay, let me mention a couple of other things. People would call me up and they'd say, Senator, we have some information about communists working here or working there. We'd like you to look into it. And one day in December 1953, I got a call from an army general. And he said, Senator, I'm down here at Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, and there's a communist here named Irving Perez. He's a dentist. Now, some people say, come on, what can a dentist do? No, is he going to be filling people's minds with propaganda while he's filling their teeth? Why would you worry about a communist dentist? Well, the fact of the matter was, sure, when, when uh, Perez was doing his dental work, he wasn't working for the communists, but he was at night. He was going to a communist training school. He was recruiting people to join the communist party. He was setting up a communist cell a group of secret communists 
on this military base in New Jersey. And this general called me up and he said, listen, we've got to get rid of this guy. Now, how do they find out that Perez was a communist? When you join the army, you have to fill out a form. And there are questions on that form. And one of the questions is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And most people write down no. Perez left it blank. And uh, some other questions, did you ever belong to communist organizations? Perez left that blank. He didn't say no. So they did some investigating, they found out, yeah, the guy was a member of the Communist Party. And they wanted to get rid of him. But nothing was done about it. And in fact, in the fall of 1953, Perez came into the army as a captain, and he put in for a promotion to major. And he got the promotion in about 30 days. Now, for six months, they tried to get him out of the army, knowing he was a communist, and couldn't do it. But when he wanted to get a job, the promotion to major, it took him 30 days to do that. So here we are in, in December of that year. Perez is still a communist. He's still working at this military base. So I decided I better do something about it. So I called Perez in before my committee. And we ask him 20 questions about communism. And every single question he says, I take the Fifth Amendment. I refuse to testify on the grounds that it might incriminate me. And I'm not going to tell you anything about any of these questions, whether I belong to the Communist Party, whether I've recruited communists at Camp Kilmer, whether I've uh, worked at a communist training school. I'm not going to answer any of those questions for you. So the next thing we wanted to find out was, how did this guy get promoted? So you know the general that called me up, we called him. We said, General, how about coming in and talking to us? And telling us how you knew about Perez and, and what you tried to do to get rid of him. And when we talked to the general privately, he said, sure, I'd be glad to help you. I want to get rid of this guy. But a funny thing happened between Camp Kilmer and New York. I held the hearings in New York on that one. A funny thing happened. When the general came before my committee, he said he didn't know anything about Perez. He didn't know Perez was a communist. He had never tried to get Perez out of the army. He told us one story in private, and they told us a completely opposite story in public. And I get mad. I'll admit it. I get mad. And I said, General, you don't deserve to wear that uniform of a general. Because you told us one story in private, and now in public you're telling us a completely different story. You've lied to us at one time or the other. Either you lied to us in private, or you're lying to us now in public. And you don't deserve to wear that uniform. And a lot of people get mad at me for criticizing the general, when they should have gotten mad at the general for not telling the truth. Now, as a result of this, the army wasn't too happy. They didn't like me picking on the army. And don't forget, the president of the United States at that time, President Eisenhower, had been a general in the army. And so some of the Army people came to me and said, look, Joe, why don't you investigate the Air Force for a while? Or why don't you investigate the Navy? We know about a, a base, an Air Force base, where there's a whole bunch of homosexuals. We'll give you all their names. Why don't you go investigate them and leave the Army alone? But I said, no way. There's a problem here in the Army. That problem has to be solved, and I'm not going to back off until we solve it. Now, in the meantime, another interesting incident came up. They brought in this woman before my committee. Her name was Annie Lee Moss. She was kind of a timid little lady, a black lady, and she worked in the code room at the Pentagon, the headquarters of the Defense Department. And her job was to take in coded messages from military bases around the world. And you send them in code so the enemy won't know what you're saying. And this woman's job was to take in these coded messages. And you know what? we found out this woman was a communist. She lived at 72 R Street, Northwest, in Washington, D.C. And we brought in a woman who had been in the Communist Party, and she said, yeah, I knew Annie Lee Moss when I was in the party. She's a member of the Communist Party. So we brought Annie Lee Moss in before my committee, and she seemed very nervous. She was wringing her hands, and they said, Mrs. Moss, are you a communist? And she said, I don't even know what a communist is. I never heard of the Communist Party. I'm not a communist. I don't know. I didn't know. They asked her if she, if, if she knew who Karl Marx was. She said, no, is he somebody on television? I didn't know anything about Karl Marx. And she played dumb. And one of the senators on the committee said, Mrs. Moss, this committee's being very unfair to you. 
And if you lose your job because of this hearing, you come and see me and I'll get you another job. And so to this day, people say that I picked on poor Annie Lee Moss, that she really wasn't a communist. But you know what? A few years later, 1958 to be exact, a government body in Washington got a list of all the Communist Party members in the Washington, D.C. area. And guess who was on the list? Living at 72 R Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., Annie Lee Moss. So if anybody tells you Joe McCarthy never exposed a single communist, you tell them about Annie Lee Moss, M-O-S-S. All right, the Army didn't like me investigating them. They wanted to shut me up. One of the people on my staff had been drafted into the Army. So the Army said, look, we're going to accuse Joe McCarthy of trying to get special treatment for this friend of his that's in the Army. And then we'll investigate him, and while we're investigating him, he can't investigate us. And so that's what they did. In March of 1954, they started what they called the Army McCarthy hearings. This is one of the greatest soap operas in American history. It was on television every day for 36 days. It was watched every day by 20 million Americans. 20 million people watched these hearings for 36 days in the spring of 1954. Now, I'm not going to bore you with telling you going into the hearings. I'm simply going to tell you that when the hearings were all over, the committee said that Joe McCarthy had not exerted any improper influence on behalf of his staff member who was in the United States Army. But what they had done was to keep my committee from doing any investigations for a three-month period. All right, now it's July of 1954, and that reminds me of something. People say that I had terrorized the American people. Everybody was afraid of me. It was dangerous to live in the United States in the 1950s. Let me tell you something. In January of 1954, my approval rating on the Gallup poll was 50%. 50% of the people polled by Gallup in 1954 admired Joe McCarthy. They thought Joe McCarthy was doing a good job. In that same year, Good Housekeeping put out its 10 most admired men in the country. The number four person on that list was Joe McCarthy. So don't let anybody tell you that the entire American population was terrified of McCarthy. 50% of the people asked supported what I was doing. And when they were asked to rate the 10 most influential and the most admired people in the country, I was number four on that list. So you should know that. All right, the Army McCarthy hearings are all over. I'm all ready to start investigating communists and government again. When a senator from Vermont says, Joe McCarthy should be kicked out of the Senate because he's giving us a bad name. And they brought 46 accusations against me, 46. They didn't like the way I conducted my hearings. They accused me of smearing innocent people. So by the time they get through, there were 46 different counts against me. So what did they do? They started another committee to investigate me. And while they're investigating me, of course, I can't investigate communists in government. These hearings go on for another three months until the fall of 1954. And they take the 46 counts and they throw out 44 of them. And they find me, charge me with two things. They said in 1952, two years earlier, I had not cooperated with a committee investigating my taxes and my financial situation. Now that committee never subpoenaed me. They never sent me a formal invitation to come and testify before them. So I was not required to testify. There was no reason why I should come before that committee, and I did not. So they accused me of not cooperating with that committee. Now, just one, one sidelight. They said I was cheating on my taxes. I was not accounting for all the money that I had earned. So the Internal Revenue Service investigated me. But they didn't publish their results until 1955. And you know what the committee, the IRS found out? I had overpaid my taxes. And they gave me a refund of $1,000. 
So I hadn't cheated on my taxes, and in fact, I'd paid too much taxes. And in 1955, the IRS gave me a refund of more than $1,000. So that's the first count that I was accused of, and that was false. The second count I was accused of was speaking in nasty terms about other members of the Senate. Now this was interesting because other members of the Senate were sure speaking in nasty terms about me. They called, one senator called me uh, Hitler. He said I was just like a Nazi, but nobody wanted to criticize him. Another senator said I was a homosexual, but nobody said that senator should be condemned for what he said. But because I said these senators were keeping me from investigating the communists, and they were helping the communists by keeping me from doing this, they accused me of, of showing contempt for the Senate. And so in December of 1954, the full Senate convened. And they took a vote on these two points, that I had not cooperated with the committee in 1952, and that I'd said some harsh things about other senators in 1954. And they condemned me for doing that by a vote of 67 to 22. Before they took the vote, a lot of senators came to me privately. And they said, Joe, we hate to do this. We know this whole thing is phony. We know it's all cooked up. We know there's no reason for you to be accused of these charges, but there's so much pressure being put on us that we have to vote against you. We don't want to vote against you, but we have to do it. Doesn't say much for the courage of those senators, but at least we know of at least 12 of them who came to Joe McCarthy and told him that privately. But then when the vote was taken in December, 67 senators voted to condemn McCarthy, not for any hearing he ever conducted, not for ever calling anybody a communist, not for ever smearing anybody, not for ever ruining anybody's reputation. Remember that, not for any of those things. It's not what he was condemned for. He was condemned for not cooperating with a committee that he wasn't required to cooperate with, and he was condemned for saying some harsh things about some fellow senators who were saying harsh things about him. That's what he was condemned for. But what this did was, it ended my effective work as a United States senator. In November of 1954, the Democrats gained control of the Senate again, so I no longer was chairman of a committee. And so in 1955, I had no more power to investigate communism. And also, that vote against me had been played up as a, a condemnation of everything that I had done to investigate communists. And as a result, a lot of people didn't want to have anything to do with me anymore. And so for the next two or three years, I made a lot of speeches I tried to alert people to what was going on, but I no longer had the effectiveness that I had had when I was chairman of a committee. And then on November, on May 2nd, 1957, at the age of 49, I was dead. I've been a United States Senator only for 11 years. I've spoken out against communism for only five years. And now at the end of, at the uh, age of 49, my life had come to an end. The problems that I was concerned about are still problems today, but there's no one around today who seems to have the courage to speak out against these things. And that's why I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk to you this morning, to alert you to what really happened in the 1950s, because those problems still exist today. And perhaps if you understand the situation, perhaps you can alert some other people and wake them up to the fact that we do face a very serious threat from the communist conspiracy in the United States of America today. And only people like yourselves armed with this information, only you can go out and try and wake people up to what is going on and to do something to deal with this problem. The answers that you need are provided in this reprint. So if you have an opportunity to write a term paper to give an oral talk in school, Choose the subject of McCarthyism and give people the factual information about what really happened in this country from 1950 to 1954. Because if you do, then you will find that McCarthyism is still the fight for America. Thank you.
question is, was there anybody that Joe McCarthy ever accused who was innocent, whose life was ruined by that accusation? The answer is no. So if somebody says to you, Joe McCarthy smeared thousands of innocent people, here's what I want you to say. Name one. Okay? If he smeared thousands, you ought to be able to come up with one name, right? There was a program on television in uh, 1982 about McCarthyism. And there's a full page out in Time magazine. And it said, make sure you tune in and watch this program. It's going to tell you about the thousands of lives that Joe McCarthy ruined. So I turned in the program to see who these thousands are. In that 60-minute program, they mentioned two people. Okay? The first person was exposed as a communist by the Atomic Energy Commission. Nothing to do with Joe McCarthy. Nothing. That's the first 30 minutes of the program dealing with this guy who, who was accused by the Atomic Energy Commission. No mention of Joe McCarthy whatsoever. The second person was a school teacher in West Virginia who lost her job because of her strained views on religion and sex. Nothing to do with Joe McCarthy. Did Joe McCarthy ever mention her name? No. Never mentioned her name. So we're going to see thousands of people whose lives are ruined by Joe McCarthy. We see two people, neither one of which had anything to do with Joe McCarthy. And you're going to find that thing happening constantly. If you see anybody saying that Joe McCarthy accused people of Hollywood of being a communist, say, nonsense. Joe McCarthy never had anything to do with anybody who was a communist in Hollywood. Never. He never mentioned the Hollywood communists. He never investigated communists in Hollywood. So if you see his name mentioned in connection with Hollywood, the people do not know what they're talking about. Joe McCarthy had nothing to do with communists in Hollywood. Yes? How can they write that in history books? How can they write it? Mm. Some of them, I suppose, are dumb. <laughs> they haven't done their homework. Uh, they repeat cliches that they hear other people say, <laughs> but some of them have to know the facts, but they just ignore anything that's contrary to their point of view. And they just leave that information out. And you know, it, it, gets, it gets as crazy as this. I have seen obituaries of people whose names came up before Joe McCarthy. And I have seen people write in those obituaries that Joe McCarthy was the chairman of a House committee. <laughs> Senators are not chairman of House committees. Now that's how dumb these people are, or so how intent they are on smearing McCarthy that they can have a senator as chairman of a House committee. So they will say that so-and-so came before McCarthy's House committee. Impossible. He had no House committee. Or they'll say they came before McCarthy's committee in 1952. Impossible. There was no McCarthy committee in 1952. He had a committee in 1953 and in 1954. So if you know these facts, you read these things, and you know, it, it infuriates me. There was a column by Tom Wicker in the New York Times last week about Owen Lattimore. And he talked about the first committee that investigated Lattimore and said they cleared him, but not a word about the second committee, which said that Lattimore was a communist. Not a word. Now, Tom Wicker is an intelligent man. Tom Wicker knows the facts about Owen Lattimore. And yet he left that information out of this column that appeared in the New York Times and that is syndicated all across the United States. Now there are some people that are dumb, but Tom Wick is not one of them. He knows what he's doing. He's leaving out anything that would indicate that Joe McCarthy was right. Yes? How did he die? How did he die? He had contract, you know, there's all kinds of rumors, you know, people think he was murdered by the communists. I, I've never seen any evidence uh, that would indicate that. And don't get involved in that. It's not important. What's important is what he said and what he did. That's what's important. So don't get into the, the other aspect. He had contracted hepatitis uh, in 1950 or 51, which is a liver ailment. And you're not supposed to drink when you have hepatitis. Because it can harm your liver and it can kill you. Joe McCarthy drank. He was not a drunk, as some people think. You know, some things you'll read, you hear people, someone will tell you he drank himself to death. False. Absolutely untrue. 
But he did drink and he should not have drunk at all because he had the hepatitis. And so it was hepatitis that he died from in 1957. And the condition probably was worsened by the fact that he did drink. But he was not a drunk. He was not staggering around all the time. Uh, during all the time that he was conducting his hearings, he was never drunk. He was always sober conducting those hearings. Uh, they used to go out to lunch. The Andy McCarthy hearings went on for 36 days on TV. It would be a morning session, then they'd go to lunch. It would be an afternoon session. And they'd go across the street to this restaurant in Washington and have lunch. And McCarthy would always have iced tea and a hamburger. And they, you know, his staff people would tell him, Joe, don't have a beer, don't have a cocktail, nothing like that. If anybody smells alcohol in your breath, they're going to say you're drunk. So you haven't had anything but iced tea for lunch when those Andy McCarthy hearings are going on, or when he was conducting the other hearings. Yes, he did drink, and maybe there were times he probably drank too much. He was not a drunk, and he did not drink himself to death. Another question. Hi, Ted. Yes. Yeah, I'm about with the House Committee on Middle American Activities after the McCarthy area during the war. In the 1940s and 50s, there were two major committees investigating communism. One was the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee, which McCarthy was not a member of. That functioned from 1950 to 1975. The other committee investigated, and then McCarthy had his committee, which only functioned in 53 and 54. So there were actually three committees for a brief period. McCarthy's committee for two years, the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee, which investigated Owen Lattimore. And that functioned from 1950 to 1975. On the House of Representatives side, there was the House Committee on Un-American Activities. That functioned from 1938 until 1974, when it was abolished by Congress. Members of Congress didn't like investigating communists, so they abolished that committee, and they abolished the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee. So while McCarthy was investigating communists, there were other committees that were also investigating communists, three of them at one time in 1953 and 1954. And those other committees were confirming or corroborating the same things that McCarthy was was investigated. And those hearings that you know we have in our office, I bet there's a couple of thousand documents from the hearings. We have all the hearings conducted by these three committees from 1938 until the mid 1970s. There are no committees today in Washington investigating communism. And that's a darn shame that we should be using. Because there is still a problem in Washington. There are still people in the Congress who are working with the communists, working with the communists in Nicaragua, working with the communists in El Salvador, and other places. But there are no committees in the United States right now investigating communism. And that's the reason why McCarthyism has become such a dirty word. They wanted to make sure that nobody would ever stand up again and try to criticize the communists. And anybody that has tried that has been accused of McCarthyism. So if you want to smear someone today and make them look bad, you accuse them of McCarthy. That's why they keep using that word and holding that club over people's heads, because it scares people away from doing anything about this problem. So we need to cover a whole new group of people who know what McCarthyism really means, that it really was something good for America and not something bad. We need to educate people to that fact and to get, please God, someone like Joe McCarthy again in the United States Senate or in the House of Representatives who can resume what he was doing and try to correct this problem that exists in Washington. Again, thank you very much for your attention, your cooperation. We'll see you in 15 minutes.